Hi everybody, it's 627 a.m. That's Eastern Standard Time. January 20th, 2018, so they say. I didn't even want to make this video. Um, I just, I've had no desire to make a video. Yeah, of almost any kind. And I've been up to my neck uh, in uh, the ancient Hebrew devising various lists um, of uh, two character parent roots, um, comparisons of uh, the modern uh, Jewish names given to the characters and do those names even represent the characters themselves uh, forming documents that take words that uh, are found in the, the King James version uh, of the Bible and what Hebrew words are used um, or let's say what that particular word, how many Hebrew words are translated into that particular word. Just, just devising so many different types of lists and charts. Um, I'm not going to show any of them because they are, for one thing, they're all works in progress. And uh, at this point in time, I really don't feel like giving away... Uh, exactly what I'm doing and how I'm doing it. Um, in the meantime, since I made my last video, I also developed a font based on uh, overwhelming um, pictorial evidence of Old Hebrew, or Obari, is what I'm calling it because that's, how should I say, uh, phonetically far more correct Obari um, the E sound at the end coming from the so called Yad um, which would typically be an indication of uh, a people type or language type um, Obar being uh, one of our very great ancestors uh, typically translated as Eber um, everything I've found thus far uh, indicates that that so-called ayin should be pronounced o, and that most of the spaces between consonants with no specific vowel inserted should be given a quick a uh, sound. So obar and of obar e obari Hebrew obari. Anyways, so of course, uh, the last video I had made, uh, I believe, was uh, me examining the third character or icon in Obari or Hebrew uh, alphabet, which is called Gimel. Um, and I've, of course, found since then that Gimel's a uh, terrible uh, word to use to describe that icon. Whatever it, it turns out to be, and I'm not 100% on any of the videos I've made concerning those icons, um, but whatever it turns out to be, um, I can tell you that uh, Gimel is going to be uh, <laughs> very far from the mark as far as describing that icon and its use. Something else I've been discovering, and that this is this video that's it's going to be a lot of random things that um, either I've been discovering or uh, brick walls I've been hitting, and why, or you know, my impressions or belief as to why I'm hitting these brick walls. Uh, I'll tell you something, you know, for. Yahweh, our God, to give to me the desire to 
do this stuff is an amazing thing because I do not possess the skill set for this. Plain and simple. I don't uh, possess the skill set or background, but he knows what he's doing. Uh, even if I don't, or especially when I don't. So, I'm continuing. I can do nothing but. So, um... <clears throat> At this point in time, I've hit a brick wall. And it's probably a good thing that I did. Um, what I'm finding out is that everybody, and I mean everybody, that I know of that's doing any kinds of teaching videos on the ancient Hebrew and showing how that it is a pictorial or hieroglyphic language and what those icons which is what I've typically been calling them today as opposed to letters or characters they're they're icons they're uh, they're visual representations of uh, an object or an action they're very hieroglyphic I believe so they're icons the people out there they're all they're doing, uh, I've found, is they're taking the modern Jewish um, representation or names of these things, and they're running with that. They're not. They're not teaching you anything new. Now, some of them that want to stay in business or or gain your trust or pervert your mind. They're going to give you a certain amount of new revelation uh, because they have to. Uh, people would smell a rat too quickly. And, hmm, I mean, they, they seem to all be gearing all of this, of course, for those who are ignorant of uh, the way language works, um, the way in which the language that's called modern Hebrew um, only only bears a resemblance in ways to true Hebrew, Obery. Um, they're definitely working uh, off of people's ignorance. So what they're doing is they're they're taking the the, the modern Jewish names or titles for these icons or letters and that's what they're teaching is that these pictures so that they're they're admitting now that they are they're hieroglyphic they're they're iconic uh, they're pictures they're not just like in the english language we have letters Right, and those letters just basically uh, arbitrarily uh, come together to form words, and then we go and we find out what those words are supposed to mean and how they're supposed to be used from sources like you know Webster and whatnot. So they're doing something very similar to that. They're not giving out any new information. They're taking what the Jewish names of these icons are. And they're trying, they're attempt, they're not attempting, I'm sorry, they're successfully teaching people that that is in fact what they are and what they mean. <clears throat> You'll find, uh, if you watch any of the videos or visit any of the websites of these people that are uh, teaching the ancient Hebrew, um, that all they can do is illustrate um, the meanings of, of these icons, what they say the meaning is, in very limited ways, very limited words. They can't show to you or prove to you why they're used in most of their other occurrences. So they pick very specific things, and then, to me, I mean, some of these guys absolutely just BS their way through this. It's it's amazing. It's absolutely fantastically amazing. 
So, um, I'll tell you, I, I, I really do wish I, I knew, um, more people that weren't either, uh, uh, complete egotists, which there's no shortage of, um, people that are, are, are absolutely sacrificing facts, um, on the altar of their own personal ego. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really do wish I, I knew, uh, somebody who had a very good grasp on Greek, uh, classical Greek specifically, because, uh, I hope to cover some of the issues, um, with the Greek used in our interlinear texts and USB texts, you know, basically the Greek that they say the New Testament was originally written in. Um, and again, that's the problem. We, we have to have somebody who is not so bloated uh, with their ego or, or so um, programmed and dead in their mind and in their heart from uh, seminary or Pharisee school, uh, that they're not willing to take a new look at this and, and ask some, some real important questions like, have I simply been taught, uh, these languages as a system, uh, that may seem to work superficially, but when you really dig in, does it honestly work consistently every time as a language some of the more honest people out there uh, first off they'll admit that about Hebrew uh, sometimes you have to even go and find uh, Muslim scholars that are going to expose the problems with uh, today's Jewish lexicon and the assumption that we understand Hebrew uh, and then there are very honest scholars out there of Greek who will admit the same thing about Greek and how classical Greek was not the same as the Greek we understand today that there were differences um, true that there there were were, were various uh, colloquialisms um, in the the writings of various authors of letters uh, and books in the New Testament. Uh, that's true, I guess. But the style of Greek is extremely different um, from book to book, and there's so many different reasons that scholars give as to why that is. I tried, and I'm telling you, every every paper uh, I've tried to write in a year, at least a year now, has been stopped, arrested at some point due to uh, a rudimentary problem with the language. Not a, not a problem with understanding the language as it's presented because most of these things I I could go to Strong's I could go to lexiconic sources uh, I could derive um, <laughs> many different meanings from uh, the text what I wanted uh, there would be so much though that I wouldn't understand like I've tried to express uh, many times in the last dozen or so videos that I've done is that unfortunately we are not let's say those of us who are actually committed to doing some serious textual or linguistic study on either the uh, the original Hebrew or the original Greek that um, make up the scriptures that we have one of our, our biggest problems with those of us that are doing this and, and are studying it digitally because, uh, I mean, with the way things 
are today, the amount of sources available, and the type of study that most serious students have to do or researchers have to do to find their information and figure it out. You, you know, you could either go the old way with, uh, with books and papers and, uh, you know, massive different types of information mediums scattered everywhere across a large desk, room, floor, something like that. Or you could do it on the computer and have various windows open and programs being used. It's just the most streamlined, effective way to study and do research. The issue that there is with people that are trying to do some serious research concerning the Bible languages is that, for instance, when you look at, say you want to look at the original Hebrew, you want to look at the original Greek, you are, for the most part, unless you can track down the single source document and look at that text, which is single source text. So, uh, you know, if you can look at, say, um, the Leningrad Codex, if you can look at the Isaiah Scroll that hasn't been altered, if you can. If you can look at um, Codex Vaticanus, Sinaiticus, if you can look at um, uh, the various extant uh, fragments of what exists in the, uh, the Eastern Greek, you know, the majority text type, looking at the source documents that's great because most people don't really understand when they go into this that those uh those words and and those contexts that they're pulling from uh are from documents that have been mixed they're mixed documents and anybody who knows anything about the laws of Yahweh. You don't mix. It's also, in my estimation, it's, it's not uh, intellectually honest uh, for... I don't even know how thrilled I am about the... Uh, profession of textual criticism because what many of them are doing they are taking multiple source texts that sometimes have variations and it's not just sometimes a lot of them have variations some of those variations are small some of those variations are not small they're significant they, like, for instance, Nessel Allen, UBS, that's kind of like the, uh, that's kind of like the holy grail of documents, which most people that are producing new Bible versions, and of course trying to get those new Bible versions that they're producing, uh, different enough from every other copyrighted version available. Um, they're oftentimes pulling from either the Nessel Allen or, of course, UBS texts, which are blended texts. They're a blending of various different codices, um, papyri, etc., that scholars, textual critics, have uh, essentially uh, reviewed and voted on what they think the best readings are and then put that into a mixed conglomerative text and then presented it to you as the text of the Bible as opposed to there are many, many various texts out there and making those available for the common man to look at. Because the thing is about a word, 
is that <clears throat> a single letter as a suffix, a single letter as a prefix, or in some languages, a single icon or character affixed anywhere within the word can dramatically change the word. So that leads me very much to where I'm at. I'm very much stuck. I was trying to come up with enough material to do a video on um, the, the, the Obery icon, so-called Dalet. So it's the fourth icon in Obery, or the fourth letter in Jewish Hebrew. And as soon as I would think that I had gotten a grip on what it probably was, then I would see a lot of other usages of it that would make me say, that's not making sense. I can't keep this consistent. Um, and so the more I, I went over it, and I, I went over this a lot. I mean, I, I scrolled through every possible word that starts with the... I'm going to call it D, because Dalit's not... Uh, Dalit is not an accurate representative word for it. Dalit, or Daleth, actually, um, is translated as door. And believe me, whatever this the, the, the D, the fourth icon in Obery stands for, it's not a door. I really, really don't believe it's a door. So I think that's a poor name for it. <laughs> So I'm going to call it a D. And I went through every single word that started with D. Uh, first, the two character parent words, and, and then the threes, and so on. I tried to decipher characters that were commonly used with it in common, concrete words. And I would get close. But again, there would be other uh, bits of information that would uh, lead me to believe that maybe it wasn't what I thought. Now, I, I kept at this, trying uh, so many various methods for deciphering what that D meant. Uh, and by the way, uh, along the way, I found that uh, my assessment thus far of the A, B, and G, which I've done videos on. Well, let's just say this. I won't retract any of that information because a lot of it I think is valuable. Um, but there's definitely a lot missing to my understanding of these icons, our understanding in general, the understanding we have uh, that we know of, there's, there's a lot missing to it. And when you, when you look at the text itself and you consider what sort of a language it, it is or has to be, uh, obviously it's a language that has a vastly different syntax than English has. Um, English is a very... It, it's very unique in its syntax to uh, other languages. Definitely Hebrew, uh, you know, its syntax is, is very different um, than English. Uh, Hebrew's syntax is very different than Greek, and that's important. It's really important. You also have to understand some important things are the fact that the same icons that are used in various ways in various words in Hebrew are also used at times as prefixes, suffixes, and what I've come to call 
affixes, uh, affixial uh, characters that are put actually in the body of a word somewhere as opposed to before it or after it. So if these same characters are being used in those ways as they are to, say, represent what they commonly represent, let's say something commonly, when you looked at it, you could clearly see that it represented a tree. J just just for, the, for an example, okay? You look at it, and it's clearly a tree. Well... Um, the thing is, when you start using uh, these, uh, these icons that clearly, let's say, clearly represent a tree, and you're using them as a prefix or a suffix or affix or however, I don't believe that they lose their meaning and have to have a meaning that is unknown to the reader. Because again, when that starts to happen, if that begins to happen at all in Hebrew, any other language, if it begins to happen, then you need a lexicon and you have to go to some other source outside of the language. Do you see what I mean? So either these icons, being hieroglyphic, have to have an inherent meaning and there has to be a sense a reasonable uh, logical sense to the way they work with one another even if they're used as a prefix or a suffix and remember something when I'm saying prefix suffix or even affix these are ideas that when we think of them in English there's something they are there's something different in another language like the Hebrew or Obari they're not used the same we can't ever think that they are used the same and that's a big one that I've discovered is that trying to and the only way I can put it right now is that this is like this is like code breaking this is like complex code breaking. In fact, I've gotten so frustrated at times that I've gone to just reading on code breaking. What kind of codes are there? How are they broke? I found out a really interesting thing about a code that Francis Bacon invented. And uh, I don't know how many of you are savvy on Francis Bacon. I believe that it's very, very possible that Francis Bacon and whatever uh, group he was working with to recreate the English language, that it's very possible that he did the final edits on the King James AV 1611. But that's a different video. It's a different story. So, uh, yeah, I've been looking into all kinds of different uh, types of codes there are. Uh, methods for breaking a code, looking at something that's encoded and trying to break it. Of course, one of my handicaps is that I've collected all the images I can online. Um, images that exist of, let's say, the oldest um, <laughs> rocks that they have that have old Hebrew characters scratched on them or old pieces of plaster or broken pieces of pottery that have painted Hebrew or etched Hebrew or, or whatever. And uh, I got to tell you, first off, <laughs> I don't buy for a second this, this notion that the further back you go, you know, the more stupid, idiot, Stone Age kind of... Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's how people were, you know? Oh, they were so, they were so stupid, or they, they didn't have any resources. They, you know, so, I mean, the only way they could kind of write how they felt was by scratching it on a rock. That's stupid. I don't buy it for a second. I don't buy paper shortages for a second. I don't. Absolutely do not.
Because that implies, for one thing, that the people back at that time were dumber than us. And I don't buy that for a minute. It also implies that they were not as um, innovative. They didn't have the ingenuity and the imagination we do. And I don't buy that for a second. But anyways... I, I compiled everything I could that supposedly was an image of an original piece of stone, pottery, plaster, whatever, papyri, that had the an old Hebrew character on it. And of course, these seem to have developed over the years, it seems. And from all of those, I derived my own font and uh, I developed that font I created it as a true type font and uh, it's j of course it's beta because I've been trying to contact what people I don't think are just complete agents because to be honest a lot of these uh, controlled opposition and agents that are out there that are teaching all these lies about ancient Hebrew I just would rather just stay off their radar for the most part I don't even want to be involved with them uh, I did try to contact one person that I figured wasn't, but um, they were no help. Um, and so I've reached out to a couple of people who are just, you know, they, they've been friends um, of the channel for a long time. People that I've talked to uh, enough times to um, believe that they are not... Uh, let's say, to believe that they are who they say they are, for help. Because I'm, uh, I'm really struggling for the information here. I've tried to find books that have actual f images of all the actual finds with Hebrew on them. Oh, of course, here's problem number one I have with Hebrew finds with uh, the old Hebrew characters written on them. Problem number one is where they've all been found. It's interesting if you start reading on archaeology. <laughs> the science of archaeology. And why it and when it even became a thing. I'll tell you what, I've got to get um, Abu al Hajj. I can't remember her first name. al Hajj is her last name. She's a professor at some uh, university over in New York. And she has a book called Facts on the Ground, in which it is said that she proves that there really is no evidence in Palestine of any older, ancient Hebrews. That's very interesting, isn't it? I find it very interesting that e Egyptology is, is just something that was sparked and, and grew uh, by all of these explorers and archaeologists that suddenly had such an interest in that place a couple hundred years ago. And up until then, nobody gave a crap. Nobody cared. But all of a sudden, they started caring. I find that very interesting. And I think if we track economically what was going on in those areas back then, we're going to get our answers to why all of a sudden all of these archaeological finds, you know, all you hear about, you know, Egyptology, all you hear about this is the Great Pyramids, right? Khufu and all the Great Pyramids. They never mention the fact that those are, they're nothing compared to pyramids that we know about in many other parts of the world. So why do they keep talking about that pyramid? It's because they want your focus on that. They want you to keep thinking about Egypt, 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 the greatest empire of the ancient world, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. They're never really mentioning the fact that uh, the place that uh, ancient Israel was enslaved in for four centuries isn't even called Egypt. It's Metzrim. It's called Metzrim. It's not even called Egypt. Well, they say that, that was, uh, it was renamed that by uh, the Greeks, maybe. And you know the thing is about archaeology and, and Egyptology 
and now we have of course biblical archaeology it's such a uh, it's such a money maker and it's such an effective propaganda tool. I mean, they've got a they've got a magazine, Biblical Archaeological Review. They've got many magazines about biblical archaeology, not a real science. And I'm not so sure that Egyptology is a real science either. And here's what I think about uh, this whole fascination with um, Egypt and Palestine and trying to draw all of these uh, parallels and make all of these connections to the ancient Mutsurim and the ancient land of promise, or Canaan, called Canaan. Um, the thing is, uh, this, this sort of archaeology, Egyptology and biblical archaeology, only really became a thing within the last couple of centuries. Before that, nobody gave a crap. And it's not as though uh, no civilization uh, or culture before then had the time to do this stuff. Come on. There's been high culture and civilization, um, at least in the countries in Europe, for a heck of a lot longer than the last century or two. So there's alternative reasons for this newfound fascination with uh, Egyptology and biblical archaeology. Follow the money, follow the power. And now what I what I think and first off I've already pretty much told you that the deal with the pyramids. Come on man, there's pyramids all over the world. A lot of them much bigger than Khufu. So, it's just ridiculous that we spend so much time and energy just looking at those. There's huge sculptures and megaliths and amazing structures all over the world. But all we keep seeing and hearing about is Egyptology and biblical archaeology. And then when you consider who runs all the media, ah, things start clicking. There are historical sites and what I believe are probably amazing structures that exist in America, and as soon as they are found, they are absolutely quarantined by multiple U.S. agencies that don't want anybody to be looking at them and figuring things out. Why is that? If you go uh, to a channel by a guy named Harry Hubbard, most of you will realize after watching a few videos by him that he is a buffoon. But he's not an ignoramus, necessarily. Now, him and another guy named Paul Schifranke, they did a video actually a few decades ago in which Paul Schifranke... Uh, gives uh, a number of reasons why he believes that um, the Dead Sea Scrolls are fugazis. But the reasons that he gives are not the reasons that I agree with. Thus, I think that Hubbard and Schifranke are some sort of controlled opposition. The strange thing I find is this, though. For, for those of you who are not aware of this, their, one of their main focuses of investigation and study has been for a long, long time something called the Burroughs Cave in southern Illinois. This is a cave where some people, uh, including them, they believe that this cave... <laughs> Get ready for this. Hold on to your seats. That this cave is the burial site for... None other than Alexander the Great. And not only Alexander the Great, but the entire Ptolemaic dynasty. Now when you consider that, and the fact that it seems that the Smithsonian exists only for the purposes of hiding facts 
about America and ancient America. <laughs> and when you consider everything else that these people are hiding, you start becoming aware of the fact that there is a great wide scale conspiracy to hide the truth of this world and our history and us people where we've come from who we are and where we're going all of us including themselves they don't want the knowledge of this information to get out why are they working so hard to hide so many things and so that brings me back to all of these various finds, these archaeological finds concerning Egyptology and the archaeological finds, for let's say, biblical archaeology, which includes ancient Hebrew, various ancient Hebrew writings, scripts, uh, fragments of icons and words. So where do I think that they came from if I think a lot of this archaeology is bogus and that it's, um, it's being used to create a mindset in us and to link these current places of, say, like Egypt and Palestine. They're, they're being used to link them to the ancient places of Metzurim and Canaan, Canaan. Well... I think like like with the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, because it was no coincidence that they were found uh, by a Bedouin shepherd boy who thought it would be a good idea to try to find uh, food for his goats in the in the Dead Sea basin, <laughs> and he's throwing rocks in caves and he hears something break. Come on. In 1947, and wouldn't you know it, in 1948, the gangster state of Israel is born. The abomination of Israel became a reality. So I think that a lot of these finds are very much like those Dead Sea Scrolls, in the sense that I don't think that all of them are forgeries. I think there's a lot of forgeries out there. Um, any one of you can uh, look into things like, say, the James Estuary, as far as forgeries and all the forgeries that go on over there. That whole place, man, everything having to do with Israel and its Department of Antiquities, its whole government, everything, just a gangster state, man, that's all it is. But... Um, What I think is, a lot of these finds, they're coming from various individuals or institutions or societies, private collections. Remember, remember, there's 30-something miles of books underneath the Vatican in their private libraries, so it's said. Now, I don't believe that the Vatican has been controlled by the same people who were controlling it hundreds of years ago. Um, I'm not saying I believe it was a Christian church before it came under the control of the synagogue of Satan. But it's different. It wasn't always under their control, I don't think. But, um, so, a lot of these artifacts, including the Dead Sea Scrolls, I believe that they were taken from these various private collections, and they were used as uh, a means of uh, authenticity, authenticating um, these places, authenticating a narrative because there would be too many independent scholars out there that would smell a rat if all of these things were nothing but 
forgeries. And of course, the, uh, uh, the various scholars and scientists out there that um, have anything to say that go against <coughs> the popular narrative, you're never going to hear from them. You'll be lucky if you can find some blogs that have uh, things to say that are adverse to what we're being told through popular Egyptology and uh, biblical archaeology and popular history. So you take a lot of these, uh, um, these different objects um, whether they be uh, rocks, uh, plaster fragments, papyri scrolls, I don't care, from these private collections so that they can pass the sniff test with a number of um, more independent scholars and scientists. And then you consider the people that are finding these things and who they're involved with and who's bankrolling all of these digs and these finds. And it starts stinking to high heaven. So what I've had to do is... I've had to, in a way trust a lot of the finds as being mostly authentic because again if they weren't if all of them were blatant forgeries they wouldn't pass the sniff test but everything else about them um, I gotta kinda look at sideways So I've had these, I've had this list of words on the screen since this video started. And I, I did that to illustrate something because there was another point I was going to make here. And, and it had to do with all these papers I've tried to write in the last year or so. And every single time, without fail, I get hung up on something linguistically. Again, these aren't matters that... If I wanted to trust Strong's, if I wanted to trust Thayer's, if I wanted to trust the other uh, uh, not as well-known lexicons or concordances, I could figure these things out based on their information. But then again, I would have to trust that these lexicons and um, concordances were working off of a solid, honest foundation. Besides the fact that I would have to trust that these conglomerative texts are being true and accurate to their originals. <laughs> Remember, there are thousands of various fragments of just the majority text type of New Testament books. So here I am, hung up on language all the time. There's a paper that I started writing a couple of months ago. And what I was doing was I was examining um, every underlying Hebrew and Greek word that is used when you see in an English translation the word Jew or Jews. I went through and found every possible Hebrew occurrence that underlines the word Jew in both the Old Testament and the New. And what happened was, I got to the end of this, and of course I used the most common, readily available tools that one could use to do this with. Strong's, Thayer's, What I was trying to determine was this. 
you see a lot of people in identity, and even people that aren't involved in identity, even people that don't believe a word of the Bible, who have done some research so that they can understand what's going on in the world today. They look around and they see that things are being uh, controlled and manipulated by a tribe of people that call themselves Jews. Now, a lot of people of a secular mind, uh, they take this information and they pretty much just apply um, as, as an equivalent those people today that are called Jews with the Old Testament Israel. And nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, those people calling themselves Jews today are an absolute stain, a blight on the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, the true Messiah of Israel. And so, that's a problem. Now, the people who are a part of the systematic theology called Christian identity, they're doing something sort of similar, but of course, um, they profess to believe the Bible. And the problem is that with the, the dogmas involved in, in, in a great deal of Christian identity that I was running into, is they keep wanting to identify the Jew as something other than the house of Judah altogether. And um, that this is, you know, this is Satan's seed. Now, I'm not saying these things to you because I'm making light of these theories. I'm certainly not. In fact, I wouldn't even be talking about these things if I didn't absolutely see the evidence that there is enough strong evidence of these ideas and these theories for them to be thoroughly perused and, and either proven or disproven. But there's a lot of obstacles in the way of doing either. And that's what I'm talking about. So, I do have an issue with those people that are part of that dogma of Christian identity, which identifies, say, the, the Jews, who, who are called the Jews in the New Testament, as always being um, a people that have no association genetically with the house of Judah, but simple, uh, I'm sorry, but simply just share the locale of Judah, because remember, Judah is not only a person, a patriarch, one of the twelve tribes. Uh, Judah is also a physical location, Judea. Okay, it's Judah, Judea. There's some issues with that, though, because the the, the main word that's used in the New Testament is "widaos," uh, um, and um, I thought by the time I got done with this paper that I had determined what was going on. That every time uh, you would see the uh, occurrence of uh, Udeos, and I have it on here, in fact, uh, right here. Um, Udeos. It's Strong's uh, G2453. And it's used 193 times as Jew one time as Judea, and two times as Jewess. It says in definition, Jewish, belonging to the Jewish nation. And the second one, it says, Jewish, as represents, or respects to birth, origin, or religion. When I did the cross-references on this Wideos, Strong's G2453, based on a trust of the interlinear texts that we're given to study from, it seemed to me pretty clear that it had to be talking about the house of Judah, uh, the specific Wideos that I just told you, G2453. 
because I would get to, for instance, um, passages like in John, uh, let's say John chapter 4, where Yahshua is talking to that woman of Samaria, or Shumron. And she says to him in John 4, 9, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You see, Yahshua never denies her assumption, her claim, that he's a Jew. Not only that, and bear with me for a minute here. Any of you Christian identity people that are just fuming, you have to bear with me because we have to work off evidence and facts. So let's look at a few things. Now, Yahshua is responding to her, and he says, You worship ye what you know not. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. And it's Huideos. It's the same word that's used throughout John when you see the arguments between Yahshua and those. It says right here in John 5.18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. It's the same word that he just used here for salvation is of the Jews. How about we go to Paul's writings? If we take a a look at, and boy is it used a lot between John and Acts, that word Jew, most of the occurrences are between John and Acts. So we're going to the fourth tab here, so we can actually uh, jump right into Romans, where Paul writes, What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Then he says, much in every way. And, and by the time he gets to Romans 3, 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles. And there he's either saying ethnos or Helen, and they just decide to translate it however they want to, depending on the passage. Uh, the business of Bible translating the last few hundred years at least is a dirty, dirty business, man. That they are all under sin. Uh, is he the God of the Jew only? Um, and so Paul says a number of very good things about the Jews, especially at the start of Romans 3, when he says, What advantage is there to be a Jew or of the circumcision much in every way? First off, they were given the oracles of God, and, and, he, and he proceeds. Okay. And I thought that that was case closed. Because when you, uh, when you go up to Revelation... And you'll see it listed right here, Revelation 2, 9 and 3, 9. Um, where Yahshua is speaking, and uh, he's addressing two different churches. Okay, the first time he's addressing the church uh, in Smyrna, and the second time the church of Philadelphia. And he says, uh, I know your works, your tribulation, your poverty, but you are rich, and I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. And then in 3.9, Behold, I will make them the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but lie. I'll make them come and worship before your feet, and to know I've loved you. Now, by the time I get down to there, and I've, I've looked at all of these uh, occurrences, about 200 pretty close in the New Testament, having to look through uh, having to look at them in the context of the english translations by then i figured okay he's always speaking to the house of judah up until the point of revelation those who say they are jews must be the house of judah right Judeos. well there's a problem with that just like with so many other words that I've come across studying the Hebrew with Strong's. And I can't believe people put so much faith in Strong's and use strong so much to prove things. It's a terrible tool. If you want to know the listings of a word, it's okay. And it's not even perfect there. I'm not going to call it a good tool. So... Like with the Hebrew, 
if you look at a word listing in Strong's, and it'll say, say, Wideus. Okay, so you, you go and you find the, uh, the suffix, the, um, the iOS suffix. And uh, there's a, there is a Wikipedia um, or, or Wiktionary uh, page that has a lot of these suffixes in it. It's, it's not hard to find, you see. All of them are blue. So they all link to a small page, uh, giving you an idea of the usage of that suffix. So you go with the common suffix that's being used um, in this Strong's listing, G2453, and you see that it says that it's, a, it's an adjective. And what it's indicating is origin. Well, if you take that suffix off the word, you're left with um, yuda. And not necessarily the same as the listing for Udas, which the listing for Udas would be the direct equivalent to, say, Judah the Patriarch, or Judah the man who betrayed Yahshua, or Judah a prophet in the New Testament, or Judah that wrote the book of Jude. This is Judah. It's, it's Udas. Now, when you take that suffix off and you're left with iuda, that is far more specifically geographical, a country. And then when you find out how many suffixes are stuck onto iuda and the various contexts, of those occurrences of Iuda, because it's not always this word right here with this suffix, uideos. That's not what appears in all these listings. Even um, Yahshua's conversation with the Samaritan woman, it's not that suffix they're using. They use a different suffix that they say, and remember, they don't they don't have the grasp on classical Greek that many scholars try to convince you they have. And it's a different suffix that they're using. Now, some might say, well, it's because the context is different, stupid. Okay, well, that's fine. Any of you that have a pretty darn good grasp of Greek and you want to be honest at figuring these things out. You're not just trying to prove your own dogma to, to help you sleep better at night. Then you can contact me and we can talk about these things. But if you're going to do that to try to school me because you're so freaking smart, save my time and save your time. And you just keep on trucking and see how that works out for you. But if you have some knowledge of Greek and you're seeing some problems with, say, everything that I've just talked about concerning the conglomerations of manuscripts, the fact that Strong's is listing Wideos as almost 200 occurrences, but when I go to them, they all have various suffixes. Suffixes change words, man. One, a one-letter suffix can change a word, can utterly change a word. And that's what's going on, is that these occurrences of this wideos, it's not always wideos. That's not always the suffix. It definitely appears that the root is widea, which is pertaining to Judah as a location. but there's various suffixes being used. There are some massive problems with these translations, folks. Even if we're not going to look at the original manuscripts, and let's say issues with them blending original manuscripts like they've been doing for a long time now, there's issues with these translations into English, man. There's some really dishonest issues. And I could go into them ad nauseum in the Hebrew, because that's what I've mostly been looking at. But here it is in the Greek, and this is what I'm trying to say. The case is not closed. There's so much going on here. 
that has been swept under the rug, kept from our eyes. And the only thing I can do is keep sounding like a broken record when I keep telling any of you that are listening to this that you've got to put your own work in. You have to study to show yourself approved. You can't just feed off the work of others. You have to do some work. Help people that are doing work. I'm not saying everybody doesn't have to be a scholar in something. Not everybody has to put, you know, this, the same kind of time in, the same kind of efforts. Man, help people who are. Determine people who are honest, doing honest work. Trying to give you the, the best truth they know of which is really all that somebody sincere and honest can do. Help them. So I made this list and I started it out at the beginning of the video. And this list, I mean all it is, it's just an illustration of how much small, simple suffixes can change the meaning of a word. You start with the word America and you add one letter to that, the N, and you have American, and that's a different word. You add yet another suffix to that, A, and you have Americana, and that is a very different word. You can add various different suffixes to America and come up with very different, very different words. Americanism, an Americanist, Americaner, Oh yes, and my uh, my Lieber office program didn't want to give me Americanist or Americaner, but they are real suffixes. And you know, the thing is, you use a real suffix on a real word, and um, sorry if Lieber office doesn't have the uh, uh, as wide a dictionary as I do. So, you can add a few prefixes and vastly change the meaning of that word, of America, from America. Those two things are not the same thing. How about the difference between American Dream and American Dreamer? Vast differences. So, the simple fact that the root Iuda has so many different suffixes, and it's all being passed off as the one and same thing, Udeus. That's criminal. I would encourage anybody who wants to, to dig in, got a little passion for this, start going through and looking at every possible occurrence of this G2453, Udeus the different suffixes and the different ways it's used. I'll tell you something this I, <clears throat> I can't say enough concerning what a, a pretty good resource this Q Bible is because you're gonna find um, translations in the Q Bible in, in the in the Hebrew or or Greek they're very uh, valuable. You're not going to find them in the same way um, anywhere else. It's a really good tool. Uh, I suggest anybody who's serious about studying uh, go and use this QBible.com. Um, and I, I have one friend that I've, I've asked to look into hieroglyphics. Now there's a reason for this because something caught my attention. I told you, the Hebrew, it's hieroglyphic, it's iconic. I went to this very simple page on hieroglyphics. It's called discoveringegypt.com. And the insight I got about how hieroglyphics are used was just invaluable. And I thought maybe if I understood a little bit more about the way that hieroglyphics are put together and their usage.
maybe I could understand more that I'm not understanding about true Obery or ancient Hebrew. One thing I found very interesting was a fourth point he was making in this category of hieroglyphic signs are divided into four categories. The fourth one, a determinative, is a picture of an object which helps the reader. For example, if a word expressed an abstract idea, a picture of a roll of papyrus tied up and sealed was included to show that the meaning of the word could be expressed in writing, although not pictorially. Do you get what's going on there? You see, um, with Obery Hebrew being a pictorial language, there's going to be all kinds of words that can't be expressed pictorially. Words that are abstract, like worship. So, even the gatekeepers have to readily admit to this, and they've, they've all got their own sort of uh, explanations for how this works, but none of them, none of them really uh, add up. So I went and looked at a Wikipedia page concerning determinatives, because I, I re really want to drive this home, and I believe that this is one of the things that's hanging me up right now on the true Obery Hebrew. For instance, I, now I just told you what that, that one site, discoveringegypt.com, their assessment of a determinative was. Now here's Wikipedia, okay? They say a determinative, also known as a taxgram or semigram, is an ideogram used to mark semantic categories of words in logographic scripts which helps to disambiguate interpretation. Now a lot of you are real smart people. A lot of you are smarter than me, but I'm going to break that down. They're saying that there are symbols used in um, Egyptian words, glyphs used. And what they are is they are telling the reader that this word cannot be expressed pictorially, but it is written to give you an idea of what we're talking about so that you can extrapolate from concrete images into an abstract idea. And if this is the case, something like that is very important. We're talking about a language and languages that are made up of hieroglyphics, icons. And that being the case, they're going to be a lot different than most of the languages that are alive and being used today. I doubt, I doubt that even uh, a lot of those Eastern languages that are still using characters that are based on a more hieroglyphic or iconical text, I doubt they have the same sort of understanding today. It, it's probably very similar to uh, what English is today, and English is the most active, alive, Shemitic language I'm aware of. But we have no understanding of the letters as characters, and even if we did, if we turn them into the, uh, the characters that they are in Obery, they wouldn't make sense in the words that they're in. You see, we're... it's different apples and oranges. So, um, that's it. That's all I got to say to you. And I would also like to add, remember, I'm, I'm always open for help. I'm not too proud for it. I don't think I'm uh, so smart, you know. I'm always open for help. Um, I believe in the past I've been um, 
approached by or uh, have been given so-called help by people that that don't want me to succeed, that don't want um, a lot of people knowing and understanding some of these things. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. But ultimately, any of you people who actually are working against humanity, coming to an understanding, a full understanding of the truth, ultimately, you're going to fail. I don't know that you can actually understand the things that I'm saying because um, I think for a lot of you, you might be so dead that you, you can't comprehend what I'm trying to express to you. Um, I'd like to be wrong about that, but uh, I don't know that I am. But any of you that want to help, um, I'm, the only link I'm going to leave in this video is I'm going to put my email address. You can contact me. Uh, I don't know everything about all that I need or the directions that I need to go in, but if this is something that you feel strongly about, that you, you, you want to know the answers you understand that there's a lot more to all of this than what meets the eye, and definitely a lot more than what we've been told. Feel free. Feel free to contact me. I don't usually turn down help. So, uh, till next time, I don't know how long it's going to be, by the way, but, you know, till next time, uh, I hope all you people, you take care of yourselves. Hope you take care of others, too. So, all right.